Good evening. I'm Helen King, and it's my absolute privilege to be principal of St Anne's College, part of the University of Oxford. And we're delighted that so many former students, family and friends are joining us from around the world this evening, as well as current members of the college. Those of you who know St Anne's, I'm sure will be glad to hear that the vast majority of our students are now back in Oxford uh, last week, we had a successful, if exhausting, Freshers Week. And now the library is back to full capacity. The dining hall is busy. And nearly all, or certainly most teaching, is back to being face-to-face, -face, with the exception of the larger lectures. This evening, a group of our current students and tutors are watching this event streamed into the Suzuki Lecture Theatre. And when I finish this introduction, I'll be joining them and carrying on the conversation and the debate with them over dinner afterwards. There are both PPE students there and those who maybe have a, a different view of the value of the subject. So of course, tonight's event, the question is, what have PPEs ever done for us? It's a topic that I can't claim to be impartial about. I studied PPE at St Anne's in the 1980s. I then went on to a 30 year career as a police officer. And although PPE is a fairly unusual in policing, I've got to say I did find the experience of my degree useful. It helped, I think, to have some understanding and to have spent some time thinking about things like why um, different political and economic systems exist and, and what their impact is, about why human rights and state legitimacy matter but can be fragile. I also developed, I think, a range of skills while studying, an ability to consider and work with complex and conflicting information and, and ideas an ability, I hope, to take on new ideas and, and concepts quickly, to think on my feet and to challenge orthodoxies. But my thoughts and experience, I'm sure, are not going to be the most interesting ones that you're going to hear tonight. And so I should introduce you to our alumni panel of St Anne's PPEs. They're all distinguished and they come from diverse backgrounds. So our chair this evening is Jackie Ashley, journalist, broadcaster, and former president of Lucy Cavendish, Cavendish College in Cambridge. Nikhil Rathi, chief executive of the UK's Financial Conduct Authority. Asia Washington, director of operations at Get Further and venture partner at ARC, both educational charities. And Will Davis, our current Gabriella Taylor Fellow and Tutor in Philosophy, who researches and writes on philosophy of mind. A huge thank you to our panel for joining us this evening and handing over to you now, Jackie. Thank you very much indeed, Helen. What a wonderful introduction. And I'm so glad to hear that the freshers are back and um, partying as only freshers can. And let's just hope that only freshers flu gets them and not COVID. Um, I'm delighted to be here this evening. Um, I wish I was actually really here in St Anne's because that was the original plan, but once again, we've been derailed, but let's hope next time we're there in person. Um, I was at St Anne's back in 1974. I fear I'm the eldest person here on this panel, which makes me feel quite like a granny. Um, I went up in 1974 actually to read English um, because that had been my favourite subject at school and I was absolutely hopeless at maths, but I was aware there was a massive reading list if you wanted to read English at St Anne's. And I realized that I hadn't read most of Chaucer, most of Dickens, all of Shakespeare, Eliot, George and TS and various others. And I was gonna be in trouble when I got to Oxford. So a few days before I thought, hmm, I wonder about PPE. I'm quite interested in politics anyway. Um, I'm sure it wouldn't happen these days, but I arrived at St Anne's on the first day and I went to see the tutors, one of whom was Gabriella Taylor at the time, Peter Aidy and Jennifer Hart, and said, I'm, I'm really passionate to do PPE. Can I change from English? 
I sort of looked at me and said, well, that's a very odd thing to want to do. Why are you doing that? And I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm really passionate about politics and philosophy, and I'm sure I can manage the economics. Um, and rather to my surprise, they said, OK, then. So the next day, there I was a PPEist and um, never regretted my decision ever. I always thought I'd read all of Chaucer, Shakespeare, Dickens, etc. in my spare time, but I wouldn't necessarily read the other stuff that I was going to do for PPE. So I'm really glad I did it. Um, at the time, there was a lot of talk even then that we were providing the governing classes um, for the rest of the country and indeed other countries as well. And I was just looking back over some of the names who read PPE, some of whom I was aware of when I was a PPE student, but I'm just gonna have a little quick canter through who has read PPE at Oxford. So Hugh Gateskull, Harold Wilson, Edward Heath, Nigel Lawson, Shirley Williams, Roy Jenkins, David Cameron, William Haig, Liz Truss, Rishi Sunak, Matt Hancock, Jeremy Hunt, from the Labour side, Miliband's David and Ed, Ed Balls, Yvette Cooper, Rachel Reeves, Annalisa Dodds, and for the Lib Dems, Ed Davian, Danny Alexander. And those are just a few, those are not all of them. So when people say this is the degree that runs Britain, um, I think there is a little bit of truth in that. So the question is, have, has PPE run Britain or has it ruined Britain? Uh, certainly some people would claim that, uh, I've even heard them claim that David Cameron's messing up the Brexit vote was a result of PPE. Um, and if only he'd done something proper, he'd have understood how to get a vote through the House of Commons. Um, I'm not sure that's fair, but I, it's fair to say that people have been reading PP and running the country in ways that have provoked criticism. Criticism from both the left and the right. So the Guardian has taken many, many um, snipes at PPE degrees, but so too has the Spectator. And the main criticism seemed to be that it produces generalists who are specialists in nothing but sort of quite good at sort of being general general knowledge people but don't know very much that they're very centrist because the degree leads to people being fairly sort of middle of the road and that's not necessarily a good thing for those running the country and that actually the people um, are very good at bluffing their way through I think that's certainly true and it's been brilliant um, training to be a journalist you know the idea that you can learn to fill it say 16 books a week which is what we used to have to do and produce two essays um, you very quickly learn the art of reading the beginning the end pick up a few highlights talk to someone who maybe knows a bit more about it than you do and sailing forth with um, absolute brim and brio saying this is what I think about this these are my conclusions da 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 I know it all perfect newspaper column perfect way to do a tv report or a newspaper column whether that is quite so good for people actually running the country, I'm not so sure. So although I'm a fan of PPE, um, I, I'm surprising myself by saying, I think I agree with some of the criticisms we've been hearing recently from one Dominic Cummings, who says that our ruling classes, he particularly attacks the civil service, but also um, MPs and ministers, don't really know anything about statistics, about data, and particularly, as we've been aware over the last 18 months, about science. And if people studied these disciplines a little bit more, we might be in a better place than we are. Now, it's a, it's a great open question, and I'm sure some of you will feel passionately that PPE is the only degree to do, and others will feel that it has far too much influence. Some of you may wish you'd done something else. I personally am very glad I did it, but I'm going to hand over to our panel now, and let's hear their views on whether they think it's the degree that runs or ruins Britain. And I'm going to start, I think, Nicol, by coming to you. You obviously were a lot better at economics than I was. I gave up the economics after my first year, but presumably for you, that was uh, the, the best bit of the course. So if you'd like to sort of chat for a few minutes and uh, tell us your thoughts, and then we'll go around the panel and then we'll take some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. And look, it's, it's really great um, to be invited to join this uh, occasion. Would have loved to have been um, uh, at St Anne's at Oxford, and uh, hopefully, future occasions um, that will be uh, that will be possible. Look, I think the best bit of the course was not having to get up till ten a.m. for lectures, right? Which is different to some of our uh, um, colleagues doing medicine or other or other degrees. Um, so I I matriculated in in uh, nineteen ninety seven. Um, and did PPE at St Anne's and then MPhil in politics uh, at St Anne's uh, as well um, and then uh, moved on to join the civil service the treasury um, uh, for a few years where um, I sort of I, had, I was really excited to do my first job was preparing the UK to join the euro and then my second job was negotiating the EU constitution you can see that that's all ended really well 
um, in terms of um, how that all landed. But as a graduate, I was, I was very excited to do all of that. I spent some time in number 10 as a private secretary to the prime ministers then, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, um, came back to the Treasury during the financial crisis and worked on financial regulation after then, spent a bit of time um, in the commercial sector, um, London Stock Exchange. I was chief executive there in the UK exchange for a few years and now um, at the Financial Conduct Authority. So I think I fit that mould you described, Jackie, of doing lots of generalist um, uh, generalist things. Um, I did actually, I, I did sciences and I was, the choice for me actually was um, when I was applying for courses, do I do chemistry or do I do PP? Because I was, um, and I decided to do PP because I went to, I'd been to a school which hadn't done, I'm been able to study politics or economics. And I thought um, this would be a great opportunity um, to pursue those interests. Um, you know, and probably, you could probably say that PPE has both um, successfully run and successfully ruined the country, depending on your, your perspective um, on life. I read, uh, you know, um, you talked about the PPA, PPSA crisis and the endless ability to sort of be creative at the last minute. And people say that's what um, prompted um, Cameron to call the referendum as he did in his speech. Um, uh, now, whether that was successful or not depends on your perspective on that, um, um, on that debate. But what I would say, what did I gain? From the time I was um, doing uh, PP1, the versatility of the courses. So you know you're doing mathematics at one sense. I did I did formal logic all the way to to um, finals and um, economic theory. The ability to interrogate events and narratives and history um, in, the, in the politics, political um, theory uh, dimension of it as well. And then the economics gives you some of the commercial um, macro perspectives and being able to join the dots between all of those different disciplines um, and um, uh, I think gives 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 you a versatility, which does help in a range of uh, range of different roles. Secondly, I think a deep understanding of the importance of political agency and accountability, um, and and I think that's something that um, yeah, it's not surprising that many PPE graduates go on to government and and civil service or public um, state type um, careers. Um, you learn to have a debate and argument about anything and everything um, rather relentlessly, um, and um, which I think uh, uh, can serve you in, in good stead. Um, I think I certainly feel I learned certainly at St Anne's. I don't know if it's, it's the same for Will now, but you learn to write quite tightly and succinctly. You, get, you have to get to the point um, uh, to uh, to get through. Um, so I would say you know that in in the last maybe 30, 40, 50 years has been beneficial. I think for um, uh, running the country. I, but I would have some sympathy with now where, from where I'm sitting and um, the world I see and, and where I've just come from, um, is it gonna be the right degree for the future? Would I want my children, I've got three children, would I want them to be doing this? Well, obviously I wanted to choose whatever they wanted to do, but I would, I would certainly hope that the PPE course evolves to enable much more data, science, um, technical knowledge to be imparted as you do the degree, because I think those are really core life skills now for anybody um, in just about any, um, any walk of life. Um, so I'm going to kind of sort of hedge your questions. I think it was, it's been really good in the past, but perhaps it's not going to be the same in the future without changing. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Uh, you clearly did a totally different degree to me. I mean, I hated logic, hated the economics and did lots and lots of the politics. I, there was sociology just coming in in those days um, and the philosophy. Uh, one thing I'm interested in, Nic Nicole, just before we leave you, is I know in Scotland they have a sort of a, more of a foundation year where philosophy has always been part of the great tradition that they teach. I mean, for me, philosophy was the most important thing because it sort of taught you how to reason, taught you how to think. Do you, do you, did you find that was really useful as well or not? Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I found it that, because it's, it's, it's something that you don't really study at sixth form. No, um, not at all. And, no. Um, and I think the kind of um, the thinking skills, um, the um, uh, study of um, subjects from first principles um, and uh, I thought I, I found I think it's really valuable a really valuable foundation for just you know many many different um, um, subjects so that's why I was really keen to keep at least one philosophy, philosophy subject right through to uh, to finals yeah lovely thank you so much Aisha we're going to come to you now so tell us about your time here I say here as if we're here, um, and, and whether you think PPE is a, is a curse or a blessing. 
Sure. So I, I started at St. Anne's in 2002. I'm a 2005 graduate, so I guess representing the mid-career. Um, and it was a really great time at St. Anne's. Like it was, I do remember the big adjustment to suddenly having to write two essays a week. And it felt like I was doing coursework twice a week for the entire length of my like, undergraduate career. And that was a massive step up. But I mean, we'll come on to it in a, in a minute, but it definitely felt that I learned a lot of skills that have certainly served me through my career. So at the moment, I am Director of Operations at Get Further. Get Further is a tutoring charity that provides tuition in maths and English for young people in, in further education who need to reset their GCSEs. So getting young people through really crucial qualifications. I'm seconded there from ARC, um, where I'm a venture partner. ARC is probably best known for running a network of academy schools, but we also incubate a lot of new charities. So charities, mainly in the education sector, but which are really ambitious and aim to achieve impact at scale. So ARC incubated Now Teach, which coincidentally was also founded by a PPEist. It was co-founded by Lucy Kellaway, who did PPE. Um, we've also incubated things like frontline and children's social work in a number of curriculum and teacher professional development charities. Um, I began my career in consulting, so I did consulting at Bain straight out of Oxford, well actually after a gap year, um, and I since also did a Stanford MBA, um, it's actually similar to another PPE, which is Sunak, but I guess my career is not quite following the trajectory of his. Um, and then I've worked at, in various places at startups, briefly in um, publishing and so forth. So I have to say that I have to kind of embrace Jackie's description of PPEs as generalists. Like I do think that that is what I am, a really strong generalist. And PPE has meant that I can talk intelligently about things that I don't necessarily know loads about, but I can rapidly kind of like, well, I hope, grasp kind of the most important things about a subject and feel my way around it um, and be able to know sometimes just a little bit but nevertheless something about quite a lot of things and sometimes you need generalists so in my career a lot of what I do has been trying to connect dots and not necessarily be the person who knows the most about any one thing but who knows the most enough that I can kind of figure out how they should fit together and then hopefully find the people who do have the deep expertise who can then do the deep stuff once I've sort of done the connecting. Um, it also helps has helped me to train questions and understand what are the important things to get to grips with. So again, knowing enough about the range that I can sort of find the value or the bit that I need to dig further into, which again, like I'm not saying that I will know the answers or have the expertise to get to the depth, but knowing what are the bits that I need to find out more about or find somebody else who does know lots and lots about it. And this is obviously, it's been a really like great fit in consulting, which is again, being a generalist, knowing lots about different sectors and being able to bring in the best from each, but also for founding new organizations and, and working within them. So as director of ops right now, the conversations I've been having this week, I've been trying to build out the finance function. I don't have a finance background, but again, it's like finding out what are the, th what are the things I need to know and who can I get to help me do it. Likewise, building out the HR function. Um, I'm not going to be doing it forever, but what are the bits we need in place and how do I find, find them? So yeah, I think it's served me well in my career. And then in terms of is PP the degree that really runs Britain? Well, in prep for this talk, I had a quick look at what all of my PP friends are up to now. So people who are kind of 15 years into their career and they're doing some really cool things. I have to say, I was quite jealous as I was flicking through everybody's LinkedIn. Um, there are a few people climbing the ranks of the civil service. There, there's one of my really close friends is now tenured at Berkeley, I think in moral philosophy or something like that. Um, I've got friends in consulting, friends in law, and then friends in leadership roles in all kinds of organizations. So in education, in charities like myself, in consumer goods, in finance, in media, um, really, really interesting things that are quite important um, 
And I think this reflects that the people I knew, at least who did PPE, were quite public minded and public spirited and so wanted to do something that had an impact on the world and hopefully shaped it for the good. So I don't have any friends who are in parliamentary politics or in really like overtly public facing roles, or at least not yet. But I do think that the PPEs that I knew, they're moving into these really solid and interesting leadership roles and quietly and, you know, fingers crossed, effectively turning those wheels that do make the country run and that hopefully make it run well. That's very interesting, Aisha. It has changed since my day. I mean, uh, I remember there was um, Damien Green actually was was running the came with the, the Oxford Union. He was a PPEist and um, Benazir Bhutto was also, you know, there were lots of them who just assumed they would head on into politics. But I think that's perhaps less the case now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Your generation, which is still not the current generation, but not far away. Yeah, and I mean, maybe some people will move into politics eventually, but it seems yeah. more that they're doing things like more in the background, but nevertheless, things that, I guess, do shape the society in which we live. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Will Davis, you're teaching it. <laughs> do you, you obviously enjoy it. You would think it's a great subject. Um, how do you, well, tell us about yourself first as well, but then how do you take the criticism that it is just sort of bringing up a generation of generalists who then go on to run the country? Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll have some things to say on, on the latter point, but just to introduce myself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I'm the tutorial fellow in philosophy at St. Anne's and um, I'm also an associate professor in the faculty of philosophy here. And I joined St. Anne's in 2019. So a fairly recent addition. Um, I have been uh, sort of knocking around Oxford for quite a while before that. I was a graduate student at Balliol College, where I read the BPhil and DPhil, and then had some postdocs, um, one in Cambridge, one back here. And then I was a lecturer in Birmingham for a couple of years before, before returning. And I'm very glad that I did. Um, uh, yeah, it was uh, a wonderful place to land. And um, I, I have been struck very much by uh, the community at St. Anne's and it's sort of outward looking approach. And I, th I think uh, nowhere more so than among our PP students. Uh, so my, my work is really, as um, Helen mentioned, in the philosophy of mind and philosophy of psychology. So I'm interested particularly in uh, understanding perception and consciousness and also um, different theories of mental illness. And I oversee all of the philosophy teaching uh, and admissions for PPE, along with, of course, philosophy appears in other combinations as well. So philosophy and psychology, um, maths and philosophy. And I do a lot of uh, um, teaching to all of our students. So I do first year um, general philosophy, which is, you know, the epistemology and metaphysics greatest hits. And then I do um, other papers for finalists, philosophy of language, philosophy of mind and that sort of thing. Um, so what about this question about, um, about PPE and whether it's the degree that runs or ruins Britain? Well, I, I must say um, that I do see a bit of a disconnect between this popular opinion and what I experience as a tutor. So I think there's a bit of a caricature that's painted, certainly in some corners, not, not everywhere, but uh, some corners of PPE is uh, an instrument of the state. So what we're supposedly doing here is preferentially admitting the children of the political elite and consciously intentionally preparing them for leadership positions in government and all of its proxies, journalism, financial institutions, and so on. It's kind of like the, you know, reflects the failed aspirations of empire. And of course, so th there was a thought that in its inception, PP really was designed to help uh, deal with uh, the, the issues that were being faced during that period of all of the unrest uh, in places like Russia and elsewhere around the world as Britain faced this uncertainty about its future in the world. Uh, so they wanted a degree that would prepare people to go out and administer the empire. At least that's one view on it. But um, I think that's certainly not what we're doing now. Uh, certainly not at St Anne's and I, I doubt very much anywhere else in Oxford. I think one, one very fundamental point to make is that PP isn't a vocational course. So this charge that what we're doing is providing some sort of post-imperialist finishing school for civil servants just doesn't at all fit the reality. 
So PPE, as I think everyone on the panel will recognize, and you've already spoken to this actually in each in your own way, but it's extremely academically rigorous. And like most academically rigorous degrees, it largely underdetermines what students might go on to do with their careers. It was very interesting to hear um, Aisha's uh, thoughts of having gone in through LinkedIn and seen all of her friends. And so there is certainly something in the idea that it attracts students who, who have an eye on, on the public sphere and want to go on to influence the world. But it's certainly not as if that's what the degree per se is preparing people to do. We're training, pe training people to think like good philosophers and think like good economists and good uh, politics students, not necessarily good politicians, but good politics students. So we're also not selling a worldview. I think that you know this idea that we're making everyone out, um, turning out centrists. I mean, for my part, you know, I, I have no particular stake in whether students leave here as you know scientific materialists about the mind or Cartesian dualists, right? As long as they can argue for their position convincingly, I, I don't really mind. And I think that point generalizes, you know, that th there isn't a package view that's being kind of in imputed onto students. We're just trying to teach you how to think. I mean, I'd, I'd like to speak a bit about admissions as well, because, you know, we, it really is important to emphasize that we're not admitting people on the basis of leadership potential or anything like that. We're not looking out for future politicos. Right. We're just admitting on the basis of academic uh, potential. So I'm, I'm very interested in whether you'll be good at logic, but actually not at all interested in whether I think you'll make a good CEO, CEO at some point. Although, of course, many of our students do end up becoming very good CEOs. And now, with that said, and to add a bit of balance, I mean, there's absolutely no point denying that PP has a global reputation as an elite degree at an elite institution, of course, that means that it will attract students who want to make a mark on the world. I think that, I mean, speaking now very much as a St. Anne's person, I really don't think that reflects our student body to a significant extent. So having spoken to the students, you know, it seems that they've applied for PP uh, largely because they're just very deeply interested in philosophy, politics, and economics for their own sake not as a means to an end. You know, so they want to understand the world and to understand humanity. And PPE gives them a lot of tools to approach those issues from various different angles. Um, but I think that certainly my sense is that this kind of hardcore careerist PPE is, is perhaps a minority here today in Oxford. Great, thank you so much for that, Will. Just one quick question. I'm interested to know, and I don't know if you know the university-wide figures, but you will certainly know the St Anne's figures. Um, how common is it for people to continue to do all three subjects through to finals? And if people are choosing two, which two are they tending to choose? Yeah, so on the first question, um, we do have some. So I think the current, right, uh, the current crop of second years has one person um, going tripartite. Um, there was another person last year who just finished up. I'm not sure about our current third years. But yeah, you know, so maybe one, one or two out of eight or so each year might go tripartite. And then as to which combinations people choose, it really depends a lot each year. So it's, it, it's pretty balanced on the whole as to which, which pairs people continue with. Um, and, you know, I think it, it depends a lot just on people's personal preference and uh, not much more than that. Great, thank you very much. Now we've got lots of interesting questions coming in. So I'm going to, I'm going to try and batch them a little bit. So the, there's a few about the, the, the composition of PPE and then there's some ones we'll come to in a minute about careers, but just looking at the ones about um, PPE itself, we have got some, an anonymous attendee. I think this is a student. Is there a perfect well-rounded degree out there thinking about the, lack of PPE of statistics, maths and science. So is there a perfect well-rounded degree that people could have? I'm just gonna find a couple more. Why is it this combination, PPE, why not others? Um, and then another one, how do you see PPE changing? Nicola, you said you hoped it would evolve and how do you see it evolving? 
So let's let's come to the panel to answer those three questions. It's really about, you know, why is it PPE? Why is it politics, philosophy, and economics, or anything else? And would there be anything better? And if it's not, if there's not anything better out there, how would this evolve to kind of change for modern times? So Nika, let's come to you first. Um, well, I think that um, why this combination, well, there's a deep history there, I guess, but obviously, as we touched on earlier, philosophy gives you some deep thinking skills, politics and economics obviously goes, can go together um, in terms of understanding the way uh, the world works and, and decisions are made. Um, but I mean, as certainly as I, what I was talking about, there were other combinations, there was economics and management, there was philosophy um, and psychology. Um, so there were, there were other combinations, um, um, but, but PP had its kind of um, uh, reputation, um, which clearly attracted a lot of, a lot of really interested students. The question that, that you know, was asked about, do I think it should change in the future? I really hope it does, because I think that, you know, the, as, as I said before, I think the ability to, um, to, to bring data science to bear um, on um, uh, economics, uh, political analysis, but also um, philosophy. So if you think about, I, mean, I don't know whether the world does any of this, but you know, the, the growth in the deployment of artificial intelligence, the challenges we're all facing now in the modern world, and I'm sure I should probably see it as well in terms of data ethics and how we can use, how big data can be used in, in society in a uh, positive and constructive way. I think those are all um, sort of skills and disciplines and, and topics that I think PPE could be adjusted to, to enable folks to, um, you know, to, uh, to be better, better placed um, in the workplace for the future. I'm going to stop muting myself because this is so annoying. Thank you very much. Um, Aisha, let's come to you now. Thank you. Sure. So, I mean, I, I guess that the subjects, I always felt that the reason that they came together was that philosophy was how you think about the world and the, the really big questions. Politics is how you organise the world. And then economics, well, money makes the world go round. So if you sort of have a good understanding of those three, then you've probably got a reasonable grasp of lots of the big questions. Um, how the degree could change. So one thing that I think is, that was really valuable that I probably didn't realize it at the time was studying logic. So formal logic um, and how you structure and make arguments. I later did a, on Coursera, I did a, a course in mathematical thinking. And I think this is like a common, I'm not, I don't feel I'm particularly strong at maths. It's kind of embarrassing that I've only got a maths AS despite having an economics degree, but doing, <laughs> Doing mathematical thinking, I realized that actually most of that was logic. And then most of what you study when you do that is constructing arguments, working out whether your premises support your hypothesis and your conclusion, um, ordering them and looking at what, what do you need to test of your assumptions to know whether what you want to conclude is true. And that, that thinking mechanism, which I will have, you know, has been embedded in me since I was about 18, has served me really, really well. So I think that's like a great kind of um, foundation to build upon. In the degree now, and I, I don't know how the degree is taught at the moment, but probably should have done a bit more maths. Um, so probably should have like had a bit of a deeper understanding of statistics, how you deal with big data sets and how you I guess, learn to critique people who will use those things to um, bamboozle and trick people. And in subsequent studies, I have done more of that, but that would be a great thing to have in the PPE degree. Um, and then some of it is what you grapple with. So I remember like, I was at Oxford when we joined the EU and just as the debate then was like, is this the end of history? Clearly not. Um, this was pre, I mean, I guess just after 9-11, but after the fall of the Cold War and supposedly the kind of Western consensus was stable and it's now everlasting, it hasn't been. Um, and have we, I don't know, have we seen the end of things like um, unemployment and high inflation and all the rest of it? And, you know, I think going into the financial crash and suddenly like, where's all the money gone? Why, you know, we thought that we're following Gordon Brown's golden rule and that we had reached the end of these like boom and bust and suddenly we're in the biggest bust since the Great Depression. Like, how has this happened? Um, 
so asking those the questions sort of that are shaping the world now and those are probably I mean those will evolve and I'm sure and I hope that the the topics being studied are continuing to evolve I guess a blind spot for maybe my generation of PPists is that we are largely all centrists and maybe I feel, for example, that I've voted on the wrong side of pretty much every election in the UK since 2010, and it's probably a lot <laughs> of my friends have done as well. So didn't really see things like Trump coming or Brexit coming or why it is that we feel so out of step with where the country seems, the direction that the country seems to be moving in at the moment. So how is it that so many people believe it would be a great thing for us to be outside of the EU, despite what experts were saying and you know we're not experts like but yeah that is a very interesting question Aisha yeah. thank you I'm going to come to Will now Will you've talked a little bit about how PPE might be changing but perhaps you could say a bit more about that and um I've got one good question I'm also going to pop in for you now it's um we've talked a lot about how PPE has sort of done bad things you know like I mentioned half in jest but half seriously that some people say oh, because of David Cameron you know he messed up the Brexit vote and so we've come out of the EU now which probably quite a few people think is a very bad thing. I have to say I do, but I probably shouldn't say that. Um, but they say, can you give us an example of where PPE has made a difference in a positive way? <laughs> well, I think there'd probably be too many to enumerate. Um, <laughs> Which is one or two would be good. Well, I mean, let, let me let me come back to that because I think that um, the, the point about uh, the evolution of PP is especially important. I, I want yeah. to speak to that. Yeah. Um, so Nicole made, made some excellent points about the need for uh, greater appreciation of the issues that are arising out of um, data science and AI. Yeah. And actually one of, one of the biggest developments in the last year or two in uh, Oxford philosophy is the new Institute for the um, Study of Ethics in AI. And uh, that's actually just got a, a kind of associated um, paper that all uh, PPS can take, along with people in other schools like computer science and philosophy on ethics and AI. And um, it's quite interdisciplinary. It's bringing people from uh, law and politics and computer science. And it's absolutely at the cutting edge of addressing these issues that we're all facing now in terms of uh, how we're going to uh, work out the moral issues that we're facing in uh, dealing with integrating AI into our lives, the legal issues, uh, political issues. So that's certainly one big change. And, and, and another thing that's happening is an increasing um, uh, integration of, uh, let's call them non-Western non or non-European um, philosophical traditions. So papers on Indian philosophy and Chinese philosophy, for example, have come out also got a paper on feminist theory. Um, and at the more applied end, again, just thinking about um, the connections uh, to real world issues, a paper on practical ethics. So those are just sort of, you know, how many, five, six um, papers that are new additions in the last five years or so. So there definitely is evolution. And that's just to speak about philosophy. And I'm not in a position to speak so much about politics and economics. I did want to say something as well, if I can, just about the um, the very first question I think you brought up about balance and this issue about you know lacking statistics and mathematics yeah. and science and so on. And, and I think it's an important point. And Nicole raised it about um, you know the, the need for people to have uh, uh, have at least some understanding of science, or at least how science works, and how to find your way around sensibly. And there is something in that, but I also want to point out that, I mean, we're a bit sort of stuck between two poles here. So on one side, we've got concerns about generalism and bringing in too much, right? And being too sort of shallow uh, in a large number of areas. And so the one concern there is, well, the more you bring in, bring in, obviously, the more you're diluting the areas that are already there. And so that's something that I would certainly want to keep a, an eye on. As someone involved in the school. But to the other end, I mean, so I think Jackie and Nikhil, you, you were quite sympathetic to the idea that really PPSR are just uh, generalists and that this was perhaps a bit of a bad thing in some respects because people 
don't have the depth of understanding of certain issues. But then I want to say, what, what about this other pole that's pulling us in, which is narrowness? It's just as common a complaint, I think, about the UK education system that we go narrow far too quickly in terms of, you know, the, the choice of A-level subjects for most students and for many people going into a single honours uh, paper um, at, at university level. And it's not clear to me that that's a better, uh, better solution for students than going something like PPE, where you're getting two or three uh, different subjects under your belt. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. You want to come in here? Well, I was going to make two points. One on the question around what has PPE done for the world. I mean, we talked a lot about the UK here, but I think we forget there's been a lot of international um, PPEists. And actually, one of the great things about St Anne's when I was there was that we had students from the US, from um, South Asia, also studying um, with us. And I'll just pick out one um, uh, yeah, distinguished PPEist, uh, Benazir Bhutto. So the first female prime minister of Pakistan, sadly now um, assassinated. And I remember when I was at, at Oxford, she came to speak at the Oxford Union. She always attached, you know, her links to, uh, stayed attached to her links to Oxford and LMH just down the road from St Anne's. Um, and she talked about how the PP degree had, had equipped her um, to go on to be a, a leader of a country in a country where there are often varying attitudes over time about um, um, edu education for women and, uh, uh, and young girls. So I think there's some very powerful examples internationally of, uh, of what PP has done for the world. I think Will's point around narrowness is really interesting, a breadth of narrowness. I think one of the things we probably should, could throw in the open is actually, are our, are our times in university too short? Like three years for breadth? And do we actually need a bit more time at the back end, as they do in some countries, for, for people to go a bit more narrow to get a bit more, more specialist? And, and um, do we just sort of encourage a three-year degree and then go into the city or professions, um, whatever, too, too quickly? I think that's quite an interesting thing for us to think about. Yeah, I, I've actually got a question saying exactly that. I think what I'm going to do, because there's a lot of great questions coming in, I'm going to pick ones out and just just give them to give each of you one question to answer. So we have a bit more of a spread. Um, Aisha, this is one for you. This is from Fliss Watts. If PPES produces a dis disproportionate number of politicians, and we're now in a pretty deep mess climate wise, even if most PPEs are not ruinous, maybe we now need something very different. So, you know, addressing the really big issue of our time climate change what do you say to that yeah that's that's a big one i mean i um yeah like perhaps we i mean i remember sorry i remember studying in pp that and uh, about democracy and i think that my conclusion then and it probably still stands now that the best thing that we could have would be philosopher kings um sadly we don't have a great way of selecting these philosophy kings so democracy ends up being the next best bet. Um, if we had philosopher kings, then we wouldn't worry so much about electoral cycles and maybe maybe our politicians would take the long view. Um, or if we selected kind of almost by lottery and picked our leaders that way. Um, I think the problem is less, perhaps less the PPE degree and more the challenges of thinking about really long range stuff when politicians are working to four year electoral cycles. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we've got two very specific questions for you. One is, should at least some philosophy be compulsory for all students? My answer would certainly be yes. Um, and secondly, this issue of the four year course, if it's all too sort of general and broad brush, would a four year course not be more sensible? So just like your answers on those two, please. Yeah, the answer to the first question, I mean, obviously, yes. <laughs> you <can say> that, <laughs> <isn't> you? <laughs> Predictably, you know, says philosopher. Um, but more seriously, I mean, so I had an interesting conversation with two friends, one of whom had grown up in Italy, one of whom, like me, had grown up in the UK. And I was telling them what I did. And I said, you know, I'm a philosopher. And um, the person who'd grown up in the UK said, well, I don't really understand what that is. And her partner, who'd grown up in Italy, said, well, do you really not have any idea even what philosophy is? And so for him, it had just been part of the, the standard provision in secondary school education, and perhaps even earlier, I'm not, I'm not quite sure on the details. But I think there's something in that. And I think it's important for people to see, firstly, what the questions are, why they're important, and also, as Nicola has pointed out, and, and Aisha as well, to get used to this way of trying to break down very, very complex problems 
in a systematic, structured way and see what might count as a good argument for or against. I think that's actually a, a surprisingly difficult thing to do. And the earlier we can get people practicing that, the better. So absolutely yes on the first. Let's have compulsory philosophy in schools and everywhere else for that matter. <laughs> here, um, here. Thank you. Here, here. Very good. And this is the second question, the four year thing. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it's complicated, right? So, um, I mean, it would certainly sort of scratch the itch that, that we've been getting at in terms of, you know, giving us both that opportunity for breadth and sending people out with at least some sort of deep understanding in one part of the course. And I mean, some of our programs are four years, I might add. So not PPE, but maths yeah. and philosophy and computer science and philosophy, at least hope they have an option of, of a fourth year option. So there are precedents there. And I mean, I guess there's no special reason other than just um, well, finance, well, student grants. Finance, well, and, and the fact that PP is the second largest degree in Oxford. So there are 750 PP undergraduates. Obviously, if every college has to make accommodations to put people up for an additional year, there's probably going to be problems. You, you, you know, you, you need a significant amount more accommodation and, and all of that. A bit easier when it's a school like maths and philosophy or computer science, which, which admits, you know, a, a tiny fraction of that each year. I mean, what, one thing to say about PP, of course, is that, I mean, you know, doing a fourth year would be an option, but also staying on and, and doing a master's is master's, an option. Yeah. And, and of course, a lot of our students do do, do, do that. And um, that, that's an obvious way that they can get that kind of depth and um, uh, in whichever area they may choose. And a lot of people, of course, don't even stay within P, the PP subjects as such. They might go on into something a, a little bit more applied or... Um, uh, what have you. You're a very good advert for your course and for more students, Will. Thank you. Um, Nikhil, I'm going to throw you, um, a, again, a very interesting question, a topical question. This is from a current student. As a student at St Anne's, it's really inspiring to hear more about what St Anne's alumni are doing. As alumni, what would you say to me and my fellow students who've been having a tough time during the pandemic? I mean, I think we would all say huge sympathy. You know, your experience has not been the same as any of ours. We were free, there was no pandemic, we could come and go as we please. Well, actually that's not quite true in my day, we had to be locked in at night, but, um, but certainly not because of the pandemic, but because we were young ladies at a ladies college. Um, but I think, Nicole, you know, what, what do we say to the current students about how, how, how they move forward, how they come through this COVID thing and how the fact that their university time has been not spoiled, but, but very different to, to what they might've been expecting. Yeah, I think um, uh, really, you know, huge praise for 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 you and and all the um, academic community that has really um, kept things going during the pandemic with all of the unpredictability that we've seen. But you know, in the, in the pre um, session um, when the speakers were together, we talked about what I said at the, where I'm working. You know, where the graduates have started in the workplace, sitting in their parents' homes and having, having, having the experience of being mentored or supported by, by folks um, in the office. So like, what would I say now? I would say, um, try and make, a, make it a positive. You are a special carder. You have been able to forge relationships in ways that um, uh, your, your uh, predecessor cohorts haven't um, virtually. Um, you um, have learned how to um, do tutorials, you learn how to, to interrogate reading lists in a totally different way. Um, and the world of work has now changed permanently in my view. Um, and so if you've um, been through an experience where you've learned um, in that way, um, think about how you can expand on that for the future. Because I think that, that, could, that could place you um, uh, in, in very good stead for, the, for when you get, to get into the workplace. And then also, you know, all the partying you missed out last year, just make the most of it for the next, um, <laughs> never will tells you. Excellent advice, excellent advice. Um, Aisha, this is for you, um, another student. I'm studying PPE, what work experience and or internships did you do? And what would you advise is useful? Sure, I think this has changed a lot. So when I was at St. Anne's, I, I was a claimant scholar. I, I don't know whether Michelle is still doing this. Michelle is also a PP St Anne's graduate. She runs an investment fund based in New York and every year she had a couple of St Anne's students go and work with her and I applied not because I was 
particularly, I think Michelle knows this, I was talking to her this evening, not because I was particularly interested in investment, but I definitely wanted to spend the summer in New York. Um, so that was my work experience. I didn't, I don't think that we took it as seriously back then. Um, I mean, now I think it's try and get whatever you think you might be interested in, try and do some of it. Um, because it's a really low risk time to experiment with different fields and almost anything is better than nothing. Um, and it's a chance to like see, see what the world of work is like because I, um, we also work with a lot of new graduates. I think that kind of adjustment from being a student to being in, being in a proper job where nobody is really telling you what to do, like you need to go and make things happen for yourself, like just getting that exposure and seeing how people work within an organization is really valuable. And it doesn't have to, it doesn't necessarily have to be what you think you're going to go on to for the rest of your life. Great, thank you very much. Um, just a couple of questions now that I will answer. Did Boris do PPE? Has he taken a big problem with the pandemic and broken it down into small chunks to get a solution? Well, no, Boris didn't. He very famously, and he never stopped reminding us of the fact, did Latin and Greek um, grapes, as it was then called, and PPE was meant to be modern grapes, i.e. the kind of the, the, the modern solution to classics when, when Boris was a young student. Um, another interesting comeback from Fliss Watts, my proposal for the ideal preparation for government would be philosophy and geography. Well, yeah, I think there's a lot in that, although I would also add some science. Um, now, this is a, a very interesting question uh, it's to Aisha, but then to all of you, actually. Aisha, you have a lot of books behind you and cool art. I'm not sure if the others get count as having cool art, but you have cool art. What three books would you recommend I read as a PPE student and in general? I knew this was going to come up me trying to think of my answer. Um, have a quick look at the three books behind you. <laughs> I have got a lot of books, which is why it's really hard to choose three. So despite the criticism of Boris just then, I would say like read the classics and also read the modern reimaginings of the classics because yeah. it's, I guess, amazing how much the ancient world like still speaks to the world now. I've been reading a lot of the, there's a lot of women writers now writing or taking the classics as a jumping off point from a, a more feminist point of view. So that's just very interesting. Um, I would say read widely, probably build on the generalist and read novels. So novels- You've are got to pick book. three books though, that, Aisha. That, that <laughs> You're um, flanneling while you think. Absolutely, I'm, I'm <laughs> bluffing my way through. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're being a PPE. Well, <laughs> well, books I love, like I love Ngozi, um, Shomanda Ngozi Adichie, her Americano is one of my favorite novels. Um, what have I read recently? Um, I, on the classics, um, Circe and the Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller, Michelle Miller, sorry, um, were just so evocative in the way that they imagined, particularly the Song of Achilles, the way that they imagined war and its effects and how someone can be twist how with Achilles how he he fought against his fate so he is he was the most effective killer but in the novel is imagined as somebody who would have been a much more rounded character not just the super efficient killer that he is known as as the greatest warrior um I'm going to leave it at two because that'll do that that's very good <laughs> Nico what would your three books be at the moment yeah look I'm going to be seriously boring here so because these are the books that I um had a big impact on me so I read the the history of philosopher Bertrand Russell in that in the summer before joining and I think that really laid the ground well for um doing philosophy and I still think about it um Rawls' theory of justice, you know, it's so hard, right? Political theory, and you have to really, really, but really force you to think. And then a bit more modern, um, thinking about running a large organization and turning it around. Um, Satya Nadella um, hit refresh um, and how he how he turned Microsoft from being a declining company into one that's that, that, that's um, that you know, it's refound its mojo. Uh, really powerful about leadership. Great, thank you very much. Now, Will, I'm going to give you a nasty challenge. You're going to have to give me three books, but that are not philosophy. Oh, are you kidding? Is that too mean? Yeah. <laughs> Go on, you can have philosophy ones. No, but I, but I wanted to say, um, there was actually something I um, wanted to say following up on 
a point that Aisha made earlier, which I found really interesting and quite striking. It was this point about humility, I think. And it came up in connection with um, the point about generalism. And she was describing this, the, the process, which I think is quite common to a lot of PPEs, that although they might not know the very sort of deep level uh, issues on a given topic, they know well enough that they don't know. And they're able to recruit people with the uh, expert knowledge um, where required. And so that made me think of a book by my um, default supervisor, uh, Tim Williamson here at Oxford, which is called Knowledge and Its Limits. And I think that especially in the current age, it's really important for us to reflect firstly on what knowledge is and how we get it, but also on the fact that we have, perhaps don't have as much of it as we actually take ourselves to. Understanding that humility and that is something that I think comes out in a lot of our PP graduates, that we really impress on them the need to subject their claims to knowledge to a lot of scrutiny. So I'll just make that suggestion and leave it there. <laughs> That's very good. Um, I've just got one, we just time to squeeze in very quickly one last question, because I think this is interesting, and I know it's a concern, and it certainly was when, during my time in Cambridge, but is it the lack of diversity which is causing the issues in the government and in large corporates rather than the fact they did PPE? Um, then this student says they're all brought up in privileged backgrounds and attended the same schools. Maybe the outcome would be different with more diversity on the course, i.e. students rather than the course itself. Now, I know both Oxford and Cambridge are trying very hard to, um, you know, to not have everyone from Eton and to increase the number of state school kids. It, it's going much more slowly than I would like to see, but it is, it is actually moving, isn't it? So I think let's come to you, Will, on that actually as well, because presumably you do admissions, don't you? I certainly do, yeah. And I mean, uh, there, there has been a pretty striking rise just in the last five years, actually. And there really are concerted efforts uh, across the university, and particularly in PPE, to, to do something about the diversity issue. I think we all recognise that historically, you know, Oxford hasn't been a reflection of society, and it ought to be. And there are just a lot of extremely talented people who are not picking up for whatever reason, OK? So just to give you a few numbers, so the proportion of um, students in the ACORN four and five groups for what that's worth to people, basically a marker of um, socioeconomic disadvantage, has risen from 8% in 2016 to 16% in 2020. Uh, another relevant group, Polar One Two, has gone from 11% to 16%. And uh, St Anne's, our state school uh, percentage is very, very high. It's about 71%, which is higher than the university average. But across the university, it's gone up from 58% to 69%. PPO is, PP is slightly below the university average, still at 62. So obviously, we've got work to do. Mm. But the numbers are all trending really quite significantly in the right direction. And a lot of that is to do with uh, the fact that as admission, admissions tutors now, we have access to a huge amount of very granular to contextual data about the schools that people have come from and uh, what, what sort of background they might have. And it allows us to take a really good look at the whole profile and understand the grades that they might be getting in context. And that, that's proved invaluable for me, having only done two admissions rounds, but absolutely invaluable to, to trying to make sure that we get the best students. And I'd like to say, I, I really think that we do admit the most able and the most deserving students at St. Anne's. Extremely so proud of that. always led the way on, uh, in this, I think, hasn't it? It's yeah. always been one of the most progressive I think, colleges. I think, yeah, we continue to do so. Yeah. Now I'm going to leave you with one final thought from Gina Moore. Hello, Gina, who I remember from, from my days. So when Peter A.D., Peter A.D. was the famous economics tutor of the 70s and 80s, when Peter A.D. let me move from greats, that's classics, to PPE, modern greats, she said, don't worry that you haven't got maths. Focus on the big ideas and let others bring in the statistics. So um, I think certainly that's what I've always done in my life because I didn't have statistics, but I slightly wish I'd learned a little bit more. Um, that brings me to say goodbye really and to say it's been a great discussion I'm sure there's there was sadly some answered questions we haven't had time for but um, I think we could have talked for another hour on this maybe next time we'll be in person and we can all get together for a little drink afterwards and discuss it in greater length and meet the students who are there 
I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of you who have joined us. I know quite a lot of students and quite a lot of alumni as well. Um, and I say a special plea to the alumni, do come back to Oxford when you can, or go to Oxford, she says from London. Um, it'd be great to see everyone back at St Anne's one day. Students, we'd love to actually meet you. Enjoy your year. I think it'll be better than last year, which is um, not saying much, but certainly saying something. So to Nikhil, to Will and to Aisha, thank you so much. And thank you very much, Helen, for your very kind introduction and for hosting us this evening. A final thanks to Edwin and to Jason, who have made this whole thing possible. Uh, I think this will be uh, recorded. So if anyone wants to get hold of a recording, it's there. And any questions, just send them to us via Jason and Edwin for the future. So have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming and hopefully meet you all in person one day. Bye bye. Thank you.